Olfactory Neuroblastoma Patient Education Meeting, February 2023. All right, welcome everyone. Um, we are pleased to have today our fourth annual uh, Olfactory Neuroblastoma Patient Event. Let me get my slide. I'm trying to share my slides. Well, welcome and, and good morning. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, as I was mentioning, my name's uh, Niall London, and on behalf of myself and Dr. Gary Galley and Murray Ramanathan, we'd like to welcome everyone to our fourth annual olfactory neuroblastoma patient event. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, the fourth annual event and uh, have many wonderful speakers who are joining us today. And uh, just want to go over quickly the schedule before we, we go ahead and jump in. Um, so this is uh, our planned schedule for today. Uh, we have some wonderful speakers who will be talking to us next about many different aspects uh, of olfactory neuroblastoma. Uh, we'll be first hearing from Dr. Carl Snyderman, who's an otolaryngologist at uh, University of Pennsylvania Medical Center. And this will be followed by Dr. Sean Raza, who's a neurosurgeon at MD Anderson. Uh, we'll then hear from Dr. Harris Flutis uh, from the National Cancer Institute, who's a medical oncologist. And this will be followed by Dr. Youngji Choi, uh, who, and, and then by Dr. Marcy Nielsen, who will both talk to us about cancer survivorship topics. And uh, Dr. Choi is from Johns Hopkins, and, and Dr. Nielsen is from uh, University of Pennsylvania as well. After we hear the talks from our speakers this morning, uh, we will then have breakout rooms. These will be small breakout room sessions, and we'll go over how, um, how we'll divide up for those when the time comes. During the talks this morning, if you have any questions, uh, I'd invite you to uh, submit them in the chat. If we have time, we'll, we'll address questions after the talks, uh, or otherwise we can address the questions in the breakout rooms. Um, so, so welcome everyone, and let's start with Dr. Snyderman. Let me stop sharing my screen. And so, sorry, let me switch something on my end over here to um, Sorry, just one second, Dr. Snyderman, trying to fix something on my end for the people who are here in person. Oops. There we go. Okay, are we good to go? Yeah, good to go. All right, I hope my audio right, is okay. Uh, it's a pleasure. That sounds great. Uh, I'm here a little bit echo, but let's see if this works. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, and I look forward to a great discussion. Um, so I'm at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. I'm going to give you the ENT perspective. Uh, my disclosures, uh, I have some uh, you know, patient videos, and I hope that isn't disturbing to anyone. Um, so what, first of all, what's ENT? Uh, you can see we go by a... Uh, a number of different names, otolaryngology, otorhinolaryngology, but basically we're head and neck surgeons mm -hmm. to cover everything in the head and neck region. Um, but most people will call us uh, ENT doctors. And so first off, what is olfactory neuroblastoma? This is a cancer, it's a malignant tumor that arises from the, the epithelium high in the nasal cavity where the sense of smell nerves are located. And so because of where this tumor is situated, it can very easily grow down into the nose towards the eye. And that's why multiple specialties get involved in, in the care of, of these tumors. Uh, another name for this tumor is, is esthesio neuroblastoma. Um, I prefer olfactory neuroblastoma because I think that's more understandable um, and uh, that's I think has greater usage uh, in the literature. Uh, the majority of these patients uh, with these tumors are between 35 to 70 years old, but this tumor can affect any age. We even see it in pediatric patients, and we'll talk more about that later. The most common symptom is just nasal obstruction. So these tumors can grow for a long time. They're hidden from view. The symptoms are very nonspecific, so it's very easy for patients to ignore their symptoms until the tumor gets very large. 
Uh, other symptoms that might be encountered include nosebleeds, uh, just nasal discharge or pain. And certainly if the tumor extends outside the nasal cavity with the brain or with, or with the eye. Um, patients may ask, why did I get this tumor? Well, there are really no risk factors for it. You shouldn't feel guilty about it. There's nothing that you've done that's caused you to have this tumor. It's not genetic. Um, you don't have to worry about other family members uh, getting this tumor. And so we can just say it's bad luck. You never know, um, you know why uh, certain illnesses arise, and this is one of them. So why would you go to see an ENT doctor? Um, oftentimes it's because the, the symptoms are very nonspecific. They sound just like chronic sinus symptoms. And so this, these tumors may be discovered uh, on evaluation for sinus symptoms. Other times a patient gets a scan for other problems. They may go to their primary care doctor with sinus symptoms, or they get a scan because of dizziness or head trauma, something that's completely unrelated. And the tumor is seen on the scan and then they, they are referred to ENT. Uh, another reason to go to the ENT doctor is for proper staging and diagnosis. So that involves uh, you know, doing a thorough examination to determine uh, and ultimately doing a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. And then finally, planning for surgery, especially when multiple teams of surgeons are involved. Uh, it's good for everybody to um, understand the, uh, the extent of the tumor and the challenges for surgery. So, you know, when I see a patient with a nasal tumor, what am I asking myself? Well, first of all, I want to know if, if this is a tumor or is it something inflammatory? Um, and if it is a tumor, is it likely to be a cancer? And there are often a lot of, of clues uh, that this is uh, malignant rather than benign. And then I want to know the extent of the tumor. Does it involve the eye tissues? Does it extend upwards to involve the brain? Has it spread outside the area of the nose? Has it uh, most commonly... These tumors can spread to the lymph nodes in the neck. Um, and then rarely uh, patients can present with distant metastases. In other words, the tumor has spread to other parts of the body, most commonly the, the lungs uh, the, or the bone. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of different tumor types that are in the, in the nasal uh, and sinus areas. And this is just a short list of all the different types of tumors that we encounter. And these tumors have different behaviors, uh, different treatments, uh, different prognoses. And so it's very important that we have a proper diagnosis. Um, and sometimes it can be very hard to tell from the biopsy, uh, especially if you're doing a biopsy in the operating room and, the, and you get what's called a frozen section where the pathologist looks at the tissue right away. They may describe it as a small blue cell tumor. And there are lots of different tumors that have this appearance. And uh, here are just two examples, uh, different uh, tumors with very different behaviors. And both of these tumors are likely to be treated by means other than surgery. So it's very important to have a proper diagnosis before we plan definitive therapy. Um, and then we move on to staging. And so we really rely on scanning, uh, scans and <laughs> examination to determine the extent of the tumor. Uh, this usually includes both CT and MRI scans because they provide different Also have a, what's known as a PET scan, which really looks at the whole body for areas of increased metabolic activity, which can be consistent with, with tumors. Uh, we're looking for tumors um, in the uh, um, lymph nodes. Um, sometimes these are actually hidden behind the back of the throat and also looking for distant metastases. And then with the biopsy, the pathologist can also grade the tumor. So that there are different histologic criteria they use to say whether this is sort of a, a, a good or a bad uh, form of the tumor, uh, what we call low grade and high grade, because uh, we know the high grade tumors have a greater risk of, uh, of spread and also recurrence. And then finally, you know, who's the surgical candidate? Not everybody is a candidate for surgery. Uh, usually that's gonna be the first choice of, of treatment for these tumors. <clears throat> but patients may be simply too sick. They may have other medical problems which prevent them from having surgery. Uh, the tumor may not be resectable. It may be too extensive and we can't remove the entire tumor. And then the other uh, question we ask ourselves, if we are gonna do surgery, what's the best way to remove it? Is this uh, small enough that we can take it out through the nose 
using endoscopic techniques. In general, uh, when I uh, am faced with a patient with this diagnosis, um, I'm gonna try to take the tumor out with an endoscopic resection. And the vast majority of these tumors in my experience can be removed endoscopically through the nose using surgical telescopes. Most patients are going to get combination therapy. So that means surgery followed by radiation therapy. Uh, the literature shows that the best results are achieved with combination therapy. Um, and then we also have to decide if we're gonna treat the neck at the same time. Um, um, there's a risk of, of spread of tumor to the lymph nodes. And uh, so that depends on the staging of the neck, whether there's clinical or radiographic evidence of tumor in the neck, and also on the grade of the tumor. Uh, patients with a higher HIAMS grade, uh, histologic grading, uh, are at increased risk for cervical metastases. Um, so the decision on whether to take this tumor out through an endoscopic or an open approach uh, primarily depends on the extent of the tumor. If the tumor is very large and involves areas outside the nasal cavity, then an open approach is often chosen. But there may be other considerations uh, that may uh, influence your decision to have it done endoscopically or through an open approach. And surgical experience of, of, your, of the team at your hospital is really a big part of that. Uh, but the principles are the same, whether the, the tumor is taken out through an open approach, as you see in this left picture, or an endoscopic approach in the right picture, uh, it's really the same. We want to get all the tumor out. The most important prognostic uh, indicator is a complete resection. And so endoscopic uh, techniques are not an excuse to perform a lesser surgery. And that's, some, that's an important distinction to make uh, because you know, not all sinus surgeons are trained in doing cancer surgery. And so you need to make sure that you will have a, a surgical team that um, you know, treats these tumors thoroughly as they're meant to be treated. If we look at the literature, uh, uh, there are now a number of uh, reviews comparing endoscopic and open approaches. And um, although there's no difference in, in local or regional control, uh, there is some data to suggest better overall survival and disease-specific survival with an endoscopic approach. Um, but there is a bit of a selection bias in that we really use endoscopic techniques for less advanced tumors. Uh, more recent data uh, shows similar results uh, showing a, a, a potential survival advantage for endoscopic techniques. But I think most of us who do these surgeries would agree that it really doesn't matter how you take these tumors out as long as they, there is a complete resection. Who should be doing this surgery? Um, you know, these are best performed by a skull-based team. And skull-based surgery is, is at the junction of two surgical specialties, nurse surgery and otolaryngology. And the best results are obtained at major cancer centers that have a skull-based team. Ideally, this team should be uh, skilled in both open and endoscopic surgical techniques so they can offer you the approach for your tumor. Um, for um, pediatric uh, patients, I think it's best if these are done by a combination of an adult and pediatric uh, surgical team, simply because these tumors are so rare in the pediatric population. And other considerations uh, um, are how good are the support services at the cancer center? Do they have radiologists and pathologists that are used to dealing with these types of tumors? Oncology specialists uh, for a delivery of other therapies. Uh, here's a picture of our surgical team, which includes both ENT doctors, neurosurgery doctors on both the adult and pediatric side, as well as an oculoplastic surgeon. So the, the basic surgical technique is called a craniofacial resection. And that basically means we're working, uh, and traditionally it meant that we were working from above and below, taking out the tumor and the tissues around the tumor. And this includes the base of the skull as outlined uh, in these pictures. Um, from an endoscopic point of view, we're putting together these three modules to do what's equivalent to a craniofacial resection. But here's a, a, an example of an endoscopic resection of a tumor. Um, should you have a neck dissection at the same time? Once again, that really depends on uh, the risk of cervical metastases, whether tumor has spread to the lymph nodes in the neck. Uh, the clinical exam is not very reliable in, in detecting these nodes. So we increasingly rely on, on imaging. The data uh, um, uh, recently suggests that dotatate PET scans are actually superior to other types of scans for detection of these metastases. 
Um, in my own experience, I've seen the dotatate scan pick up uh, small metastases uh, that uh, normal imaging missed. So it's a very sensitive technique that can highlight very small areas of tumor. Uh, patients with a high high IMS grade are also increased risk for cervical metastases. So even in the absence of uh, um, metastases on imaging, we might consider doing a neck dissection to remove those lymph nodes. Um, about 10% of patients will have uh, uh, lymph node metastases at the time of presentation, and then another 10% will develop them later on in follow-up. And so one of the challenges is, is determining who's at risk for delayed um, development of metastases. I think with this improved imaging, with the use of dotatate scans, we can better detect these uh, small areas of tumor and more effectively treat the neck early on when it's going to be more effective. Well, when is surgery not an option? Uh, here's a 15-year-old patient of mine with a very large olfactory neuroblastoma, uh, simply too large to take out with good margins. And so we um, opted to uh, give this patient uh, uh, chemotherapy first to shrink the tumor and then do surgery. Uh, very brief. Surgeons will say, well, if the tumor is in the brain, then you really can't take it out endoscopically. And this video shows us that that's not really true. Um, you use basically the same dissection techniques that you would with an open approach, and you can achieve the same margins uh, in the vast majority of these tumors. Uh, this is the kind of defect that you see after the tumor is removed. And then we have to fix that hole. We have to separate the brain from the nasal cavity. And there are a variety of different tissue flaps that we can uh, use. Oftentimes, we take some tissue from the thigh, some deep fascia, and then we place this vascularized uh, flap from inside the nose to provide a good reconstruction so that uh, the patient doesn't develop a spinal fluid leak or infection. There are many cases where we can't use a flap from inside the nose because of the tumor. In that case, we developed what's called an extracranial paracranial flap. And this really involves borrowing the inner layer of the scalp and tunneling it through a little window in the bone. And this is done without uh, a formal craniotomy. So we don't have to take off the flap in and reconstruct the skull base without any functional or, or cosmetic defect for the patient. And what can you expect uh, you know, after surgery? What are the risks of surgery? Well, the, the number one concern is getting a spinal fluid leak, and that occurs in up to 10% of patients or more, and that can uh, almost always be fixed with a very simple a second surgery and with the use of a, a spinal drain, um, but we want to treat those leaks when they happen. Uh, if we ignore the leak, then there's a high risk of developing infection around the brain or meningitis. That, uh, a postoperative uh, spinal fluid leak is the number one risk factor for infection. Probably the biggest problem for patients in the long term is crusting and just sinus problems. Um, certainly, that's a consequence of, the, of where the tumor is and the surgery. And radiation therapy after surgery is a big contributing factor there. Uh, unfortunately, most patients are going to lose their, their sense of smell completely uh, because of where the tumor is and the extent of treatment, whether that's you know, surgery uh, and or radiation therapy. And although in, in very small tumors, we can sometimes save the sense of smell on one side, um, you should expect to lose your sense of smell completely with the surgery. And that has a secondary effect on the sense of taste. Um, you know, the flavor of food really comes from, from the sense of smell and not from your taste buds. The risk of injury to the eye or having a significant brain injury or stroke is very low with these surgeries. It really, really depends upon the extent of the tumor. Um, and generally speaking, uh, there's going to be packing in the nose for up to a week after surgery. Uh, you may have a, a drain in the, in the lower back for, to drain off spinal fluid for several days, and hospitalization is typically around four to five days. Um, once things are healed, then we like to start radiation therapy as soon as possible. In reality, that's probably going to be one to two months after surgery. And then patients need to be seen frequently in the first few months just for cleaning of the nose and monitoring the healing process. But there's an ongoing need for, for surveillance. You know, really need to follow patients for life uh, for at least 10 years. I've seen these tumors come back after 10 years. And so um, you know, uh, yearly visits are necessary uh, for nasal endoscopy, looking for local recurrence, 
and also with follow-up imaging to make sure there's no evidence of spread to other tumor sites. Once again, the dotatate scans are a very good surveillance technique uh, for recurrence. Uh, most recurrences are going to be local at the site of the original tumor or regional in the neck uh, involving lymph nodes. Um, um, many recurrences can be treated with additional therapy. Uh, most commonly, that would be surgery uh, with or without radiation therapy. Um, there is a new uh, radiation technique that shows promise that we've been trialing in a small group of patients so far. And this is uh, using a, a compound that is um, uh, attached to a chemical that, that targets uh, these types of tumors. And, and, um, and this, there's a radioactive molecule that's attached uh, to this, to this um, um, other molecule. And so this delivers radiation right to the tumor site. And so this is called Lutathera. Um, and we've uh, tried this in six patients so far um, um, and with some good response. You can see three examples of tumors that have responded uh, to this treatment, but this is only used for patients who have failed all, over th all other therapies. So these are patients with uh, multiple recurrences that cannot be treated with additional surgery or patients with metastatic disease that can not be treated with effective radiation or chemotherapy. Um, so all of this is a promising treatment. I think we really don't have enough experience, and this will, will require collaboration between multiple centers to really uh, collect enough data. So I'd like to thank you for this time to speak with you. I look forward to the, um, the um, room sessions for further discussion. And if anyone has any follow-up questions for me, this is where you can reach me. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Harbour, who's a nurse director and a nurse surgical director of the program. Well, thank you so much for uh, for having me as part of this event. I think it's always great, um, you know, for sort of high experience uh, clinicians and patients to get together to sort of talk about where the field is headed. I was uh, asked to provide the the quote unquote neurosurgical perspective in terms of management of of uh, olfactory neuroblastoma, and I imagine sort of given the event, probably many online uh, already have a good understanding of what esthesia neuroblastoma or olfactory neuroblastoma is and in terms of management of newly diagnosed disease. And really what I want to focus on is really, you know, some of the answering, some of the questions that I often get in my clinic in terms of once patients have finished treatment uh, for their newly diagnosed olfactory neuroblastoma. And as you heard from that great presentation from Dr. Snyderman, you know, the treatment for someone that's newly diagnosed uh, typically consists of surgery followed by radiation therapy. And then depending on the unique biology of that tumor, maybe chemotherapy along with radiation therapy after surgery. And usually what happens is after patients have finished radiation therapy, uh, you know, we typically get a scan, um, you know, a couple of weeks after finishing and when I'm sitting in clinic with my patients, there are usually some common questions that come up. You know, one question that my patients often ask me is that if my tumor comes back, what will my treatment options be? The second question I often get is that does surgery still play a role uh, if my tumor comes back? And then the third question I often get is if I've had radiation therapy before, can I have it again if my tumor comes back? And so what I want to do is just really take the next 10 to 15 minutes to sort of answer some of the data that we use to answer these questions. In terms of if these tumors come back, as you heard from Dr. Snyderman, they can come back in, in different patterns. And we categorize the pattern of recurrence as local. So with olfactory neuroblastoma, they can come back locally either at the skull base, in the sinuses, or along the undersurface of the brain and the envelope around the brain. Then you have regional recurrences. For example, they can spread to the lymph nodes in the neck. And then you can have distant metastases in terms of when these olfactory neuroblastomas come back, sometimes they can spread to other parts of the body. And several years ago, we looked at our own institutional experience just to see, you know, how do patients do in the long run and where do these tumors come back? 
And this is the distribution of recurrences when these tumors come back. You know, about 50% uh, of the time, it's typically local. 30% of the time, approximately, they're regional within the lymph nodes. And about 11% of the time, it's distant. And, you know, really armed with this data, this is really what guides the indications for radiation therapy to the skull base and to the neck after surgery for someone that's newly diagnosed. And given the risk of distant metastases, specifically with the higher HIAMS grade esthesia neuroblastomas, that also guides the indications for uh, chemotherapy along with radiation therapy after surgery for someone who's newly diagnosed. But it's these patterns of recurrence that also guide uh, once someone has finished treatment, what scans do we typically use to follow along? We typically use an MRI scan to assess the skull base, the brain, and the sinuses, yeah. and then use a dotatate PET to scan the entire body. And dotatate is a an agent that's really specific to neuroendocrine tumors, and anesthesia neuroblastoma is sort of one of those tumors. And so in terms of the long-term outlook, you know, this is sort of the surveillance strategy that we typically use. And also when tumors come back, we typically look at the distribution of recurrence. Is it local, is it regional, or is it distant to help figure out treatment options? So I'm really going to focus on the treatment options for local recurrence, because that's usually what I deal with is from the neurosurgical perspective, along with my head and neck surgery colleagues. And you know, as I often counsel patients that are newly diagnosed and recurrent with this or other types of cancer is that we often require or look at multiple treatment options to provide the best long-term outcome. And the treatment option can, can consist of either surgery, radiation therapy, or systemic therapy, and it's all basically tailored to the biology of the tumor. And specifically, when we're looking at local recurrence for esthesia neuroblastoma, we're typically looking at, you know, whether or not we should do surgery or whether or not we should do repeat radiation therapy. And you know what's promising is that we've seen so much evolution in each one of these treatment buckets. As you heard from Dr. Schneiderman, we've seen so many, so much innovation with regards to surgical techniques uh, so that our toolbox is much wider and, and versatile. We've also seen the development of different radiation uh, techniques. And then also, of course, newer systemic therapy agents, too, that I'm sure you'll hear about later on. And oftentimes, from the patient perspective, it can be a little confusing in terms of trying to figure out what makes sense if their tumor comes back. And so I'm sort of going to take you through a little bit of the decision making that we go through in terms of figuring out at the time of recurrence what makes sense. So first off is really what role does surgery play uh, at the time of local recurrence? You know, with other cancers, what we've seen is that sometimes surgery really has very little to no benefit when their cancer is recurred. And so uh, a year or two ago, you know, we actually looked at our own experience to see in patients presenting with recurrent cyanonasal cancers, including esthesia neuroblastoma, in those patients that we take to surgery, does achieving negative margins still have an impact? And the whole idea of achieving negative margins really is that from the surgery perspective, if we're taking a patient with a cyanonasal cancer to the operating room, not only do we want to remove all the visible tumor, but in three dimensions around the tumor, get tissue samples that the pathologist studies during and after surgery to determine whether or not we've cleared all the microscopic cells out. And what we want to figure out is, does achieving negative margins, removing all the visible tumor still have an impact? And what we found is that in select patients, if we are able to achieve negative margins at the time of recurrence, that surgery still has an impact in terms of reducing the risk of the tumor coming back and improving overall survival. And the key word here is really sort of in select patients. In patients where we feel that we can't achieve negative margins, it doesn't seem that surgery has much of an impact, but in those patients where based on the MRI scan at the time of recurrence, that if we can get all the negative margins, that surgery has an impact. And so in our own practice, we do look at surgery as a tool that we use in the management of local recurrence. Now, you know, there are some unique considerations at the time of recurrence that factor into, you know, our own decision making here in terms of what type of surgery should be offered and what the nature of that surgery is going to be. You know, some of the things that I look at is really what was the previous surgical strategy you know, the endoscopic endonasal approach now in our own practice is used probably about 80% of patients that are newly diagnosed. We also look at the degree of tumor involvement. So a little bit of an anatomy crash course, you know, in terms of where these tumors arise, 
you know, you have the, the brain and you can imagine the brain sort of sits on a bony floor called the skull base. And that's sort of like the first floor of your house. And there's carpeting along that floor called the dura or the meninges. And the olfactory phyla began at the top of the nasal cavity and traverse that bony floor, traverse the envelope around the brain and run underneath the brain. And in terms of figuring out really what the ideal surgical strategy is, we look at the degree of involvement of the bony skull base and the dura. Then even more so from the neurosurgical perspective, we look at the degree of extension into the space where the brain is in terms of how much of the meninges is involved. Is there any evidence of brain invasion? And then we look at the degree of involvement of the basement of the house in terms of the paranasal sinuses and all those air-filled compartments that sit below the skull base. And then the other aspect is really looking at the degree of involvement of the orbit. Now, you can imagine the orbit is sort of like a cone, and the base of the cone is where the eyeball sits, and the walls of that cone, there are sort of multiple layers similar to an onion. The outermost layer is the bone, the then next layer in is a very thin envelope called the periorbita, and then just inside that are really the muscles responsible for eye movement that attach to the eye. And not only in newly diagnosed patients, but the time of recurrence, we look at you know, to what degree is the orbit involved? Is it just the bone? Is it just a thin envelope around the brain? Or is there really involvement of the muscles, for example, or fat around the eye? And that really dictates the type of surgery. And then the other key consideration is really reconstruction. Because oftentimes what we're doing, is, you know, not only newly diagnosed patients, but also at the time of recurrence, is not only resecting tumor underneath the brain and in the sinuses, but also resecting that bony floor that the brain sits on and the envelope around the brain. And that envelope around the brain not only holds in the brain, but holds in spinal fluid. And so we want to avoid a spinal fluid leak after surgery. And at the time of recurrence, we have to look at oftentimes alternative strategies to reconstruct that skull base to avoid sort of wound healing complications. So in terms of the surgical strategies, as you heard from Dr. Snyderman, they've evolved over time, not only for newly diagnosed, but also recurrent patients. You know, uh, Really, the tremendous advancement several decades ago was really where neurosurgery and otolaryngology coming together to combine approaches where oftentimes, from the neurosurgical perspective, we would create a very limited bony opening, a craniotomy, and then the head and neck surgeons will work from below via facial incision, and essentially, we could tackle multiple compartments of the tumor uh, in a coordinated fashion. And then with the introduction of endoscopes or endoscopy and know-how and training from both otolaryngology and neurosurgery side, really the endoscopic approaches have become the favored uh, strategy for a lot of experience in high volume centers in terms of tackling these tumors. And when you look at newly diagnosed esthesia neuroblastoma patients in our practice, about 80 to 85% of them get their resections done completely endoscopically. Now, at the time of recurrence, those recurrences are often anatomically more challenging. And as I showed you on the last slide, there are a lot more considerations. And when we looked at our own experience, really the you know, distribution of approaches is sort of split across all the different strategies that have been used over the decades. And the reason why I show this slide is that ultimately it's important to have sort of all these tools in your toolbox in terms of all these surgical approaches in order to achieve those negative margins. And what guides the use of a surgical approach is really that the anatomy of that recurrence. Now, when we look at outcomes in terms of the management of recurrent uh, cesium neuroblastomas in our practice, about 87.5%, 87% of the time, we're able to achieve negative margins. Uh, and then in terms of surgical complications, you know, there's always been a concern about with the reoperation is there an increased risk of complications in comparison to someone that's undergoing surgery the first time around? And what we find is actually there's really no difference in surgical complication rates. And we tend to grade surgical complications based on the severity in terms of there's some complications that can simply be managed with medications such as urinary tract infection, others that may require some sort of intervention. And what we find is that majority of the complications happen are the less severe complications that can be simply managed with medication and really don't increase the length of stay or recovery. But the more common complication that we see at the time of reoperation is really a CSF leak. And that has to do with that reconstruction between the space where the brain sits and the envelope around the brain. Now, as you heard from Dr. Snyderman, uh, we often rely on healthy tissue with good, good blood supply to reconstruct that uh, cavity and separate the space where the brain sits from the nasal cavity. 
And whether we do the approach the surgery open or endoscopic, we tend to rely on this tunneled pericranial flap that really sort of covers everything. And this is harvested from the scalp. There are five layers to the scalp and the innermost layer has robust blood supply. And so this is a nice sort of tissue layer that can be used to reconstruct that space and prevent a spinal fluid leak. Now, with the reoperation with local recurrence, the challenge is oftentimes because of previous surgery, this pericranial flap may not be present or viable and uh, or may have been radiated the last time around. And so in those cases, what we typically rely on is to work on our with our plastic surgeons where they harvest tissue from elsewhere in the body that has healthy blood supply to plug this space up between the brain and, and sinuses so that we can avoid that post-operative complication. Now, as I mentioned earlier, is that at the time of recurrence, especially, that surgery alone is really not the fix. It's a combination of treatments that are really needed to avoid this tumor from coming back again. And this is where really repeat radiation comes into play. Now, traditionally, the thought process, process was that, you know, once patients have received high doses of radiation therapy at the time of their initial diagnosis, is that they weren't eligible for radiation therapy again. And this sort of is derived from the fact that the brain and the optic nerves, which sit at sort of the back end of the skull base, have very limited tolerance for radiation therapy. And as similar to surgery, how surgery over the years has become much more precise and tailored, the same has happened on the radiation front. And what that means now is the time at the time of recurrence, that repeat radiation, as a matter of fact, is a feasible option in select patients. And again, in the study, when we looked at management of recurrent uh, cytonasal cancers, including asthesia nervostomas, what we found was that including post-operative re-irradiation therapy at the time of recurrence after surgery also had an impact on long-term outcomes. And so this is part of our decision-making process. And we have a group of radiation oncologists that are experienced with re-irradiation therapy and the factors that they consider in terms of whether or not additional radiation therapy can be given and someone who's received treatment before is we, you know, they look at the previous radiation fields in terms of what dose, what volume of area was covered. They also look at those critical structures along the brain and underneath the brain that really don't like radiation therapy. And they look to see, is there room for additional radiation therapy to avoid those complications that we worry about with repeat radiation therapy? And then the other factor that they consider is really at the time of recurrence after surgery has been done, what dose is really needed and where does that dose have to be delivered? Now, a little bit more about, you know, other patterns of recurrence that we deal with from the neurosurgery's perspective is, you know, while the you know, majority of the recurrences when they occur are local, you can also have these distant recurrences that occur in the envelope around the brain along the meninges. And these can occur several centimeters or well ways away from the original site of surgery. And, you know, I think a lot of us have learned over the years that this is the reason why the MRI scans are important with surveillance is to, you know, catch these drill recurrences earlier on. And oftentimes, and this is from a series of patients treated here, is that they can occur and they're often small recurrences that really don't affect the underlying brain, but are just sitting on the surface of the brain. And with these types of recurrences from the neurosurgical perspective, instead of using surgery as sort of the, the first treatment option, what we typically do is look at very focused radiation therapy, specifically you're looking at gamma knife stereotactic radiosurgery. There, of course, are different types of radiation therapy. Uh, when we're talking about newly diagnosed or recurrent esthesia neuroblastomas of the skull base, we're talking, typically looking at proton or photon-based techniques that are designed to cover really larger surface areas or volumes and higher doses. You know, the analogy for stereotactic radiosurgery is sort of like having 200 la 201 laser pointers that can be focused on a very sort of small area to deliver those high doses of radiation therapy in a single session. And we typically look at stereotactic radiosurgery as that first-line treatment in patients that have recurrences in the meninges or the dura wells a ways away from the skull base. And in this multi-institutional uh, study published several years ago, what they found is that 48% of patients treated with this strategy, as a matter of fact, had a good response rate. 41% had stable tumors that had not grown just after radiation therapy, stereotactic rated surgery. And 11% of patients had tumors that were still growing despite radio surgery that ultimately required surgery. So overall, I think pretty good uh, outcomes and with very low complication rates. <laughs> so to wrap up, you know, what I wanted to answer were these three questions. First off, uh, 
you know, given the pattern of recurrence, we look at, you know, MRI scans and PET scans to follow patients. And then if my tumor comes back, what will my treatment options be? For local recurrence, we typically look at surgery uh, uh, along with radiation therapy. At the time of recurrence, we do know that surgery can provide benefit in select patients. And then for patients who have had radiation therapy before, there is room for additional radiation therapy based on previous radiation fields. And certainly systemic therapy uh, is playing an increasing role in the management of recurrence, and I'm sure we're going to hear about that later on today. So once again, thank you very much for, uh, for including me and sort of providing my uh, perspective in terms of managing uh, recurrence and what happens uh, you know, after patients have finished initial treatment. And certainly I'm happy to take any questions now or feel free to email me later on at the address below if, if you'd like to touch base about any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Raza, for the fantastic talk. Um, we will uh, move on to uh, have Dr. Flutus give his talk. He's actually here in person, but uh, given multiple computers in person, we're, we're having him give his talk from, from the office just around the corner. Uh, so Dr. Flutus is a medical oncologist here at the National Cancer Institute. And um, go ahead and share your slides, Dr. Flutus. Well, let's see. I think you're muted, Dr. Flutus, or... We have Dr. Flutus just a second. It looks like he might have dropped off. Or um, Dr. Choi, if if you're oh, here he comes. Okay, yeah. Sorry for that. Um, here we go had some uh, unanticipated uh, Zoom uh, problems. So permissions were granted and now I think I can share. If I only find the correct uh, desktop, Zoom, which I think is um, this one. So. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, all right. So, uh, after this uh, short delay, thank you. Um, a good day to all. I want to thank uh, Drs. London, Gali, and Ramanathan for the opportunity to present to the meeting again. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to do that uh, in the hybrid format in person, even though currently I'm not in the room with them. So uh, my name is Harris Fludas. I'm a head and neck medical oncologist with the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda in Maryland. Um, there I collaborate with the head and neck uh, surgeon scientists uh, of the surgical branch of the National Cancer Institute, including Dr. London. So following the excellent and uh, comprehensive talks uh, by Drs. Uh, Snyder and Raza, I'm going to share some thoughts about the medical oncologist's uh, perspective on olfactory neuroblastoma. This is a talk that is uh, focused to the recurrent metastatic disease, which is what we predominantly work on at the NCI in general and for olfactory neuroblastoma. So therefore, I will first provide some general uh, background about the selection and development of systemic treatments. And then we'll talk about um, these topics in the context of olfactory neuroblastoma. If you have attended the previous year's uh, meetings, you may have seen part of this presentation again, but this year there is uh, additional context. So, um, okay. So at the time of initial diagnosis and uh, primary treatment, the disease, as you heard, is most often confined to the head with or without involvement of the lymph nodes of the neck. And uh, in that stage, the oncologist is less involved in treatment planning compared to the surgeons and the radiation oncologists. And we'll just be prescribing chemotherapy to accompany surgery before or after it, or with radiotherapy before or after. There are various opinions and, and ways to do that. Later on, after the primary treatment, a patient may develop a recurrence, and that might be confined to the head and the neck again. And if for any reason, uh, surgery or radiotherapy cannot be offered anymore, or in any case that there is further metastatic disease, such in the lungs, the 
the, the bones, uh, then a treatment with systemic anti-cancer medications will be needed. And then at this point, we consider that the recurrent metastatic disease is not curable. And our goal is to control the disease for as much time as possible with the least possible toxicity. So the task of the oncologist is to select the appropriate treatment for each patient. Now, to select treatments, we need evidence. The highest quality of evidence comes from clinical research and in particular from clinical trials that are prospective and test the treatments to establish their efficacy. This process of objective benchmarking leads to FDA approvals and um, that is for specific indications and generates what we call standard of care treatment. This is usually summarized in consensus guidelines published, uh, issued by groups of experts, such as the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines, which are the guidelines that most oncologists um, tend to, um, to seek for guidance when dealing with uh, tumor types that they may not be very familiar. If there's not enough clinical research, we have to make assumptions that are based on studies of past experience in the form of retrospective data. These are considered of lower quality, though, in comparison to clinical trials. And then if retrospective data is also non-existent, we're forced to extrapolate from what we know, what we have seen from treatment of tumors that we think may have similar characteristics based on pathology and molecular features. But research is also required for the development of new treatments. Then drug development starts in the lab uh, and involves detailed studies of DNA, RNA, proteins of tumors, the way they interact with other tissues, such as immune cells, blood vessels, etc. So laboratory research relies on the provision of samples of tumor and blood that we can obtain from regular clinical practice, but it's even better if we can do it in a systematized way through clinical research. So what are the broad categories of systemic anti-cancer treatments that oncologists can generally select from? We have the, the first one is chemotherapy, which started uh, basically in the 40s, and it's broadly active against cancer cells, but can also directly harm the normal cells. Examples are cisplatin, etoposide, cyclophosphamide, and a lot of chemotherapeutic agents. Then, following some decades, there was the development of targeted medications, uh, which was the result of molecular biology research. The year 2001 is there as, the, as marking the approval of imatinib. So, target cancer cells, the targeted medications can target cancer cells with particular features, such as mutations, hormone receptors, high vascularity, and they can be monoclonal antibodies and small molecules like um, trastuzumab, a monoclonal antibody, and imatinib, pazopanib, sirolimus, small molecules that uh, affect specific pathways in tumor cells and are toxic to the cancer cells, but less toxic to the regular cells. The next development was immunotherapy, uh, which the first approval of ibilimumab was in 2011, and it's marking the immunotherapy, the modern immunotherapy, I think. So immunotherapy activates the body's own immune cells to attack the cancer, and well-known examples are pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and there are others as well. But the activated immune uh, system can also attack any normal part of the body. And the most recent development, one can say, is adoptive cell therapy, which is indeed a form of immunotherapy itself and consists of uh, CAR T cells, uh, first approved in 2014, NK cells, uh, TCR uh, modified uh, T cells, and, and various other approaches that are in clinical trials actually. So these immune cells are engineered to recognize features of the cancer cells and attack them and um, have specificity, but may generate an intense reaction in the body. So immunotherapy and adoptive cell therapy produce responses in a minority of patients, but when they do that, these responses are quite durable in, in, in um, contrast to what happens with chemotherapy. So that's why a lot of it is, uh, a lot of current research is looking to expand the efficacy of immunotherapy and adoptive cell therapy. Now, 
The development of all these treatments over the last decades has had significant clinical impact. Uh, there's been a drop in the overall mortality of cancer by 33% since 1991, according to the American Cancer Society. This drop has also probably having to do with uh, improvements in early detection, surgery, and radiotherapy and supportive treatment. It's not just the new medications, but still, uh, we consider that quite important. And indeed, in some tumor types, such as in melanoma, uh, it has completely changed the outlook for patients. But um, does that include olfactory neuroblastoma? Well, unfortunately, not. According to a publication in 2022, there has been no improvement in survival for factory neuroblastoma in the last two decades. And let's see, what is the anti-cancer medication landscape in factory neuroblastoma? We know there are no FDA approvals. There is no formal standard of care. And the available, the available data on efficacy and toxicity are limited and heterogeneous. They come from retrospective descriptions of smaller groups of patients, and they are very scarce in the context of recurrent metastatic disease. We have better descriptions of what is the response to treatment in the form of uh, chemotherapy that accompanies the definitive treatment. So let's see what are the current recommendations of the experts in the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. So here's a screenshot of these guidelines, and you can see in the pop-up that there are recommendations just for two regimens. One is a combination of two chemotherapeutic drugs, and the other is a combination of three chemotherapeutic drugs. The Supporting uh, publications, according to the table, so for the two-drug combination, there is a paper published in 2000 a retrospective review of 27 patients treated between 1981 and 1998. And for the three drug combination, they cite a paper published in 2006, which is a retrospective review of eight patients treated between 1998 and 2004. Both of these recommendations are category 2B, which means that they are lower level of evidence without uniform consensus of the uh, experts panel, but with no major disagreement. But importantly, it can support the insurance approval for off-label use of these medications. And some arguments for the efficacy of chemotherapy regimens to shrink, to shrink tumors, to reduce the size of the tumors, come from data published on chemotherapy given around surgery uh, for primary treatment, as we discussed. Now, what else might be available? Beyond chemotherapy, we have some reports of targeted therapy being efficacious, some reports of about sunitinib or everolimus with or without cisplatin and pazopanib. We know from uh, patients' histories that immunotherapy has been used, but there's no publication around it and no good body of evidence. Does it do anything? Does it do nothing? And recently, there Lutathera has emerged as a potential uh, treatment for recurrent metastatic disease, as Dr. Schneiderman uh, very um, rightfully um, told us. So there's been a report of a couple of patients, actually three, that were treated in the context of a basket trial, which is a trial uh, enrolling patients with various types of tumors, not necessarily the same type. And this is, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, a small uh, group, but still it offers some objective uh, data to be used for uh, decision making. And uh, I know that various centers across the states are offering Lutathera off label to patients with olfactory neuroblastoma. So that's an approach that one might pursue and might uh, lead to interesting new therapeutic uh, approaches. Is the situation improving? Well, Yes, there is some trend for improvement. Uh, you can see here the, in the plot the sustained increase in uh, ONB of factory neuroblastoma studies published over the last decades. It's still not too many studies, but there is an uh, increased number of them. And um, notably, the quality of these publications is improving in the sense that they're including molecular studies, which have a potential to inform novel treatment hypotheses. And in addition, we know that there is development of clinical models uh, like cell lines and mouse models in the lab, just like uh, Dr. London is doing. So how about clinical trials addressing olfactory neuroblastoma? 
there are significant challenges that have to do primarily with the rarity, which uh, affects the sample sizes, the trial accrual, and the pharmaceutical company support. We are trying to address this with uh, this uh, challenges with the resources of the NCI, and you will hear later that we, we think we're doing a good job on that. And other um, challenges have to do with the disease characteristics, whereby the local recurrence and versus metastatic disease may be tricky for some aspects of clinical trials, especially having to do with imaging assessments, which are the core of uh, efficacy determination. So uh, that being said, we are conducting a couple of studies here. The first that we have uh, to offer is a natural history study, not interventional. We collect, uh, we want to collect contemporary uh, thorough descriptions of the course of the disease and improve our knowledge. And we try to um, uh, facilitate uh, this by even uh, just uh, having remote enrollments and collecting uh, the data that we're asking for. We also can bring patients here to have imaging and uh, collect some samples as well. There's also a clinical trial of immunotherapy that we started uh, in, in July, and it, it involves a molecule that is combining two mechanisms of, mechanisms of action um, in an effort to improve the efficacy as compared to immunotherapies approved for other diseases. So this medication is called Bintrafusp alpha. The trial started accrual in the summer, as I said, and we have enrolled as far as seven participants, which is, uh, I think, a remarkable number for a rare tumor in this short amount of time and an achievement in itself, uh, because it's a proof of concept that showing we can actually do trials. And even if we cannot fit every patient's particular scenario, we're trying to, to start with answering basic questions, for example, the efficacy of immunotherapy. It's too early to report the results of this trial on efficacy or toxicity, but um, since we are still open to accrual, I think that's an encouraging hint that we are not uh, having significant concerns about toxicity. And I want to note here that all our trials are enrolling patients from all over the states. So these are, uh, so we are, I think, uniquely placed to uh, catalyze the conducting of clinical trials. Uh, and we are covering travel expenses, treatment costs. So all we need is participants' awareness and uh, enrollment. And there is an additional trial that I have found online in Japan for Ricardo factor lobastoma, which involves uh, oncolytic virotherapy uh, with uh, herpes virus. But I haven't seen any results uh, online. I'm eagerly waiting to see something because this is a virus, uh, a virotherapy that's been approved in, in Japan, at least for, I think, glioma. So, uh, we are also trying to uh, actively, we're also trying to develop additional trials. And I think that uh, in next year's uh, meeting, I will be able to present some results of the currently ongoing trial, along with additional trials. And as a comment, it's important for patients that are finding themselves in, in the unfortunate position to need systemic therapy to go and search on clinicaltrials.gov themselves and then go back to their oncologists because sometimes, um, you know, oncologists uh, in, in their uh, daily routines may not have the chance to thoroughly look uh, on, the, on the site and may miss something that otherwise might be uh, an option, a treatment option. There are trials of uh, various phases that may be able to accommodate patients with olfactory neuroblastoma, even though they may not be particularly aimed for them. So um, that was what I have to say. It was not uh, much, but we're hoping that we'll be making a difference. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Flutis. Um, we will proceed to our next speaker, which is Dr. Choi from Johns Hopkins. And she will be talking about some aspects of cancer survivorship. Thanks so much, Dr. Choi, for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Good morning, and maybe it's good afternoon um, <laughs> for some of your good evenings. Let me, now I'm gonna actually stop sharing because my mouse is disappearing on me. Sorry, I'll launch my slides first. Apologies. All right. 
So hopefully you're able to see my slides now. Um, so once again, thank you for having me today. Um, I have spoken in previous years. So for those of you who hear some information that sounds familiar, hopefully it will be a good review and actually have some updates in terms of um, guidelines as well. So my objectives um, for our time uh, together today uh, was to talk about aspects of cancer care that I feel primary care providers like myself can help deliver and manage. And I was specifically asked to talk about uh, cancer-related fatigue, kind of the causes that are behind it, as well as potential ways to manage. So I wanted to, first of all, um, provide a lay of the land in terms of what we mean by survivorship. And I really like this definition from the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, um, talking about how survivorship actually starts at the time of diagnosis and proceeds along this continuum through and beyond treatment, recurrence, cures, and the final stages of life, regardless of the cause. And that it refers not only to the person who is undergoing kind of this, the cancer or diagnosis and treatment, but for the family and friends who are also involved in their care. So I think um, considering that as the de definition for cancer survivorship, you can really see that primary care um, and a primary care provider can really walk alongside you. Because um, I really think about primary care or your general internist being your long-term care provider. They may have help assisted in your cancer diagnosis, and they're really there to support you through treatment and beyond. So some roles specifically around cancer survivorship that your primary care provider can play is to help monitor for cancer recurrence and screen for other cancers. So in the context of olfactory neuroblastoma, it may be working with your ENT and your neurosurgeon to make sure that we're getting the MRI or the dogetate PET scan kind of in a timely manner. And if there are issues in getting that scheduled, your primary care doctor may be able to get involved there. Um, we can also help with uh, manage, co-managing some of the effects of cancer and cancer treatment. And so I'll talk about cancer-related effects specifically, but I think Dr. Nielsen will be touching upon some other cancer-related effects as well. Uh, we are very equipped in primary care to think about care coordination. So we deal with other diagnoses outside of cancer, like diabetes or heart conditions that require working with a lot of different subspecialists. And so care coordination is certainly in our wheelhouse, and um, we work hard to, to do that. We treat other medical issues, like I just mentioned, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, um, and we don't want to forget about those when um, a cancer diagnosis and treatment happen. And I think the um, kind of hallmark for what we think about in primary care is also preventive care and encouraging um, healthy behaviors and lifestyle. So I'll spend some time kind of talking about where specifically where we can help with other medical issues and preventive care, um, and then talk about cancer-related care. So. Um, what we know from the literature is that individuals who have cancer are have a lot of uh, can have a lot of other chronic medical problems, and so the majority of patients have high blood pressure at cancer diagnosis. So this is thinking about adults more than pediatrics, and um, twenty eight to fifty eight percent of cancer survivors um, have high cholesterol, and this is a higher proportion than those without a cancer history. Um, cancer survivors uh, may be more likely to develop things like diabetes. Um, and then kind of recent reviews um, have suggested that there's a higher risk of heart disease for cancer survivors, things like heart failure and stroke as well, even when we adjust for what we consider traditional risk factors, so people who have high, high blood pressure and diabetes. And I think why this is important to know is I think sometimes when you um, or encounter a cancer diagnosis and having to go through all that, some of the other stuff might get forgotten. Um, and I think why it's important to kind of stick with your primary care doctor through some of that is not only for support through the cancer, but also so that they can help you keep track of some of this other stuff. Um, and there are some data suggesting that people who are cancer survivors may be less likely to be taking their cholesterol medicine, their high blood pressure medicine, and the diabetes medication. And having a primary care doctor involved may help you stay on top of some of those things. And we also have data, and this is um, from uh, our breast cancer survivors, colorectal cancer survivors, and prostate cancer survivors. But I think um, that data can be applicable to those of you here today with olfactory neuroblastoma, that care receipt is better when you have a primary care doctor involved. And so in these studies of these other cancer types, what we've seen is that preventive care. So for example, when I talk about preventive care, we're talking about things like vaccination, so flu shot screening for cholesterol or diabetes, bone density testing, and screening for other cancers like colorectal cancer with colonoscopy or stool tests, those things are more likely to be completed when we have both an oncologist or cancer or cancer provider and a primary care doctor involved. 
And then for these specific cancers, breast, colorectal, and prostate, cancer-related testing for those cancer types also were more likely to be completed when both the oncologist and primary care doctor were involved. So I think this is an argument for why don't drop your primary care doctor when, when something like you know, unexpected like cancer may happen, because I think there is a role for us to play here in making sure we take care of all of you. And then um, the other aspect that I'll just touch upon is, you know, cancer-related effects and cancer treatment-related effects as they um, relate to fatigue. And so I think cancer-related fatigue is hard because it's usually not just one thing that's causing or driving the fatigue. I think if you asked a non-cancer survivor, are you tired? Are you fatigued? I mean, I think 99% of Americans would say yes. And then I think when you overlay that with a cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment, it, it just makes it a little bit more complex. And so here are some of the factors that can be related to cancer-related fatigue. So how are you sleeping? How are you eating? And we just talked about how sense of smell and sense of taste can be affected by uh, olfactory neuroblastoma and its treatment. Pain can certainly um, drive fatigue and be related to that. Mood, things like depression and anxiety. Um, cancer treatment and cancer itself may make you more um, or less likely to be active. And so less physical activity can certainly drive fatigue as well. There may be other medical issues, medications and treatments, such as surgery, chemotherapy, radiation can all um, be involved in, in causing fatigue. So what we know about cancer-related fatigue is that it is treatable. Um, it may not be, it might be hard to make the fatigue go away completely, but there are things that we can do to make it better. And um, I'm pulling from the NCCN or the National Can uh, Cancer Compre Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines um, that were referred to before. And they have a specific guideline on cancer-related fatigue, which is, which is wonderful. And so where we have the strongest level of evidence is really around exercise. So moving, staying physically active, and I'll go into that a little bit more and, and ways to do that. Um, there's also this category of what we call psychosocial interventions, and that's really thinking about what are practical ways in the way we live every day to try to recoup our energy. And so energy conservation, that might be thinking about the day and, oh, I have two doctor's appointments. That might not be the day to schedule a lot of other things in or scheduling, thinking about scheduling a strategic nap. And maybe thinking about keeping a diary and what that daily schedule might look like so you can really be mindful and intentional about the structure of your day. There's also data around yoga, cognitive behavioral therapy, specifically for sleep, which we'll also talk about, and also things like mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction. So the NCCN also puts out a really nice set of survivorship guidelines for providers. And they're also kind of, there's a counterpart for patients as well. And I just pulled um, a kind of summary slide from those guidelines. And the most updated ones are from last year, but I know they're updating them currently. And so um, a lot of these kind of talk about um, areas of care that we can think about from a preventive standpoint. And so a lot of this involves diet, physical activity, and kind of weight management, things that I might bring to your attention that are a little bit uh, updated, I think, from the last set is, you know, this idea of uh, drinking alcohol sparing, sparingly, if at all. I think there are prior guidelines saying, you know, no more than two drinks for men or one drink for uh, for women. Um, on an average night. And really, I think we've walked back the alcohol guidelines to saying probably less is more and maybe none is best. Um, and then things about, um, you know, tobacco, uh, smoking cessation, practicing sun safety, and then they have a whole category of things around sleep. So just to talk a little bit more about exercise and physical activity, I think um, there are kind of guidelines in terms of time and kind of what type of exercise, but I think what we're finding is that having some degree of physical activity on a daily basis is important. Um, I think especially through the pandemic, so much of what we've done is sitting in front of a computer, which is what I'm doing right now, sitting in front of a computer, doing a lot of Zoom meetings and not getting up and moving. And so, you know, the goal is really to try to avoid a sedentary lifestyle and do things every day and not just being kind of like a weekend warrior. Um, in terms of aerobic exercise and cardi or cardiovascular exercise, um, we used to kind of have this, you know, do 150 minutes, great, but it seems like there's also been this movement in terms of guidelines to say, 
more is probably better. And some of this is also thinking about what your daily life looks like, and it just may not be achievable. But um, at least 150 minutes a week with a goal of 300 minutes of moderate exercise, aerobic exercise. And if it's a more intensive exercise, and we'll kind of get into what's moderate and intensive, um, 75 minutes um, weekly, and trying to kind of divide that up across the week. Things like strength training, we also think are important two to three sessions a week. And then there's some sorts of activities that may be kind of getting your heart rate up as well as doing strength training. So it doesn't have to be just one or the other. In terms of exercise intensity, the survivorship guidelines do a really nice job kind of breaking this down for us. Like, what does that mean? And so kind of general principles, moderate exercise that you can talk but not sing. Um, I think the most accessible one in terms of this category is really walking outside and making it a brisk walk. Um, vigorous exercise, you can say a few words without stopping to catch your breath. So this might be more like you're jogging or running. But, um, you know, I think in terms of principles of exercise, doing something that's accessible and something that you enjoy are going to be the things that are most maintainable. And I think, you know, when we think about 150 minutes or something like that, that seems really hard to kind of um, get to. But I think you start with small steps, right? I think the things that are most achievable are saying, well, let's start with maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes of walking every day. And then maybe you make that twice a day so it doesn't have to be this huge chunk of time. And then, you know, right after cancer treatment, after surgery, chemotherapy, your energy levels may not be there. And so sometimes getting um, other providers involved, like a physical therapist to help you kind of get your strength back when you your decondition can be really helpful. We also talked about how sleep can be impactful in terms of cancer-related fatigue. And so I just have some snippets from these NCCN survivorship guidelines for kind of do's and don'ts. And so the general goal is to try to sleep seven to nine hours each night. Um, and to have a set bedtime that is the same each night as well. So I think we have this in mind for any of you who are parents and, or, or, and had children. Um, you know, we try to provide that structure um, and it's probably helpful for us as well as adults. And so trying to, trying to have um, a schedule every night and kind of what that bedtime routine looks like as well. Um, saving the bed for sleep alone. So really trying not to work in bed, not watching TV in bed can be helpful. And then some of those other external factors that may be more likely to keep you awake or wake you up. So making the room pitch black, using blackout curtains. Some people use sound machines to kind of um, work with the noise. And then, you know, we've all done it. Staring at the alarm clock is, is not going to help anyone. So really turning that away um, so that you don't stare at that and kind of perseverate on that can be helpful as well. And then um, the things to avoid. Um, so avoiding eating and drinking a few hours before bedtime can be helpful, even if you don't have something obvious like acid reflux. We, um, you know, sleep experts say that kind of avoiding this a few hours before bedtime can still be helpful. Caffeine intake can be impactful in terms of ability to fall asleep or stay asleep. So really avoiding that after 12 or one o'clock. We already talked about alcohol use a little bit in general, um, but alcohol can also cause fragmented and less restful sleep, and you may be more likely to wake up in the middle of the night. And then the other big thing, which I think is probably a pitfall for the majority of us, is really trying to avoid screen time right before bed. Um, so that includes your TV, your computer, your tablet, even if you're kind of doing the black screen mode um, and, and, your, and your phone. Um, so I hope in that short period of time, I was able to kind of um, provide for you areas that I feel like your primary care doctor or your family doctor or internist can really help in managing cancer survivorship related care um, and just some pearls for um, thinking about causes and management of cancer related fatigue. And um, just the plug to think about looking at the NCCN guidelines. So I pulled my information from kind of provider guidelines. There are some really nice patient facing guidelines as well that you can look into. So thank you for your attention and your time. Thanks so much, Dr. Choi. That was fantastic. Um, we appreciate you and, and uh, Dr. Nielsen joining us. Uh, we wanted to have an emphasis this year on, on cancer survivorship in our, uh, in our event this year. And we're looking forward to hearing also from Dr. Nielsen as our last speaker this morning. Um, she is from the University of, of Pittsburgh and uh, looking forward to hearing her talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Choi set this up nicely. So I'm going to try to focus on a couple of different aspects um, just to bring a little bit more um, kind of holistic perspective 
in addition to what she's already mentioned. So I'm gonna use a very similar, if my slides will advance, yes. I'm gonna use a very similar definition to survivorship. So this is that survivors and, and people like different titles. So we use survivorship, but there are others um, in cancer survivors that wanna use thrivership. Uh, but in general, in addition to being from the time of diagnosis, we know that there are also multiple components um, that occur after you start treatment, after your diagnosis, and that impacts you. So the physical aspects, which we've talked a little bit about, the social and mental and emotional aspect, but also the financial aspect of just a diagnosis and treatment and potentially additional treatments. And so all of these components are aspects that we have to be aware of as providers so that we can help identify resources for you to optimize your functioning and your quality of life after treatment. And what's a little bit harder for us as providers is that this definition is does include your family members and your friends and your loved ones who also go through this process with you. It's different. They're not experiencing the physical changes that go, but they're there to support you. They're there to really try to, op again, help you through the process and achieve the best quality of life as possible. And so how can we also meet their needs in this process? And we do that by delivering high quality of care. We've talked about some of these focuses already, the surveillance, the screening, the prevention, how to really address health promotion, um, who on your team can help address all of these issues. But in the early 2000s, there was a report that really brought to light that patients, as they get away from this intensive follow-up in the first couple months after treatment, um, and as they continue to live longer, we need to have a better understanding of how to manage what we would call their treatment-related effects. We need more evidence. Again, as cancer survivors are living longer, we're getting a better view of what happens five to 10 years down the line and collecting evidence on how to best treat them. And then coordination of care. Many times, if you have multiple um, treatments, you may have multiple side effects and treatment effects. And so it's, it's a difficult system to navigate if you've never been into a multidisciplinary large center. I mean, how do you navigate those? And who can help you get appointments? And who can help you with um, financial um, fight ways to maintain your financials? gas for driving? What can we do to help you get through this process? And so that is really where, you know, care coordination and other team members like nursing um, can help with you. And so this is, we've talked about guidelines. We've talked about the NCCN guidelines. There are also guidelines from the American Cancer Society. And what I will say to you when you look at this is that these are really based on kind of head and neck cancer survivors, which is a very vast group and does incorporate um, olfactory neuroblastoma, but these will be focused on more the more prominent groups. However, I think looking at these, you probably will acknowledge that you experience some of these. So we've talked about hearing loss, we've talked about sleep, we've talked about fatigue, and then there are others. And this will change based on what treatments you have, um, if you have multiple treatments, even in the progression of, if you somebody mentioned radiation before surgery, you may have um, different treatment related effects. And so I think if you look at this, it looks like a long list and I always think it looks very comprehensive, but I'm sure that you can pick out effects of your treatment that are probably not on this list. And one of the ones that I see as kind of glaringly empty for this population is the nasal changes. But those other changes are not really captured here. Other changes that I look at um, in terms of my both clinical practice and research would be cognitive changes, which are also not listed in here, but we know uh, more and more that uh, individuals who have radiation and maybe not chemo can still have some cognitive changes. And so we need to be aware of them. And so what's the difference between a late and a long-term effect and does it matter? 
So uh, long-term effects are something that happen during treatment. So if you're experiencing something during radiation, smell, fatigue, and it kind of persists after, we call that more of a long-term effect. And I think these are a little bit easier for us to identify because they you have them while you're undergoing treatment and then they continue. So it's easy to connect them. Now, late effects of treatment are something that happens at some point after you're done treatment. And so many times um, patients or survivors may not recognize that this could be related to their cancer. And so they may not bring it up during a follow-up. And depending on how we ask questions, um, it may not come out. So it's important to know that these happen. And these are very, these are more rare, but these are some of the ones that um, can and do happen. And the hypopituitarianism and hypothyroidism are something that we do see regularly. And this can be five to 10 years down the line. It can be more um, soon. It's just is very variable. But these are things that, again, happen kind of down the line and maybe a little bit harder to recognize that they're collected, connected to your treatment because you're already done. And so I think this is important. It's a very basic kind of quote from someone, but survivorship is not surviving without quality of life. And that's our goal. Our goal is to understand um, your, how cancer and its treatment has impacted you and to identify ways that we can um, partner with you to address these side effects of the treatment. And again, we do have guidelines. The American Society of Clinical Oncology looked at the American Cancer Society's guidelines and said, we do agree with these. However, this needs to be a team-based approach. And if you look back at the list of late and long-term effects, you can imagine that they need different providers to really fully address because they span a lot of different topics, dysphagia, swallowing difficulty, musculoskeletal difficulty, um, hearing loss. Those are different providers um, to leverage to address those issues. So team-based approach includes your primary care clinician, making sure that you're, they're aware of your diagnosis, that you have your health promotion and your preventative um, tasks complete and on time, your oncology specialist, your medical, your radiation, your surgical oncologist, your otolaryngologist, also other providers that come into play depending on where your treatment is, are dentists and other allied health professionals. And that's gonna include nursing, speech language pathology, physical therapy, clinical psychology, um, dietitians. So, those individuals will have a role to play and it may vary depending on where you are in your treatment and what treatments you're receiving. There are ways to do survivorship care and this, depending on where you were treated, this may differ. Some, page, some institutions have a really general survivorship care program where they're seen by a provider who's got kind of knowledge on all the areas. And then there's others that have a more multidisciplinary kind of integrated and or disease specific approach. And so we at the University of Pittsburgh and at UPMC take a more um, multidisciplinary disease specific approach. So we see patients um, in the head and neck and, and, and in the surrounding areas. We see patients pre-radiation, not usually pre-surgery or pre-radiation and then we follow them throughout. And this can occur in one visit and it's tailored. So while all these providers are there, if you are not having any musculoskeletal difficulty, then that's not a provider that you can see or you don't have to see, but they are available. And there are other essential components of what we do, engaging you as the patient. So walking in and finding multiple ways to explore um, what you're experiencing and also giving us an idea of what you want to prioritize in your care. And then community networks with um, head and neck and olfactory neuroblastoma, there are smaller numbers of patients with these um, diagnoses. And so many of you may be traveling distances to a center to be evaluated and seen or treated. And so partnering with community services that 
uh, so we can educate them and make sure that they can deliver, you know, high quality rehabilitation care, dental care with um, knowledge of your diagnosis. And so this is going to be different for um, maybe you than it is for some of our more general survivors, head and neck survivors. But the point of this slide is that is as we've talked, many patients will see more than one treatment modality. They may start with surgery, whether it's open or endoscopic and radiation, plus or minus chemotherapy. And the more treatment you have, the more likely it is that you will experience an issue that changes your daily activities. And it's very common. So that is what this slide says, that it is very common. It is very common for patients to have complex treatment related needs and side effects, and that we need to really be prepared to address these. And so one of the things that I focus on in our practice is really the musculoskeletal impairment and dysfunction that goes along with, with surgery, but radiation. And so this will be a broad group, but what neck disability is, is it is pain in your neck. So that can come from different kind of um, cramping from the muscle. It can come from surgical sites and it can come from fibrosis, which is just that stiffening of the skin and the muscle. And we know that it happens after surgery, but when we add additional treatments like radiation, we know that it can become more prevalent and it can have an impact on quality of life. And so while the neck it is going to be dependent on if you have a neck dissection or if your neck is treated, um, the neck and shoulders are very common side effects. Um, but there are others that may go in, coincide with them, like swallowing dysfunction and or fatigue. So one of the things that we do is we do have a physical therapist present in clinic. And so if you're have multiple treatments and maybe you have lost weight or you're fatigued, you're, you're just really kind of what we say deconditioned, the physical therapist can address those musculoskeletal issues like your neck and shoulder, but they can also work with you to build a plan to try to increase your endurance, increase your, um, your ability to do daily activities. They address things like posture, um, gait, balance, and then they can collaborate with others. And that's one of the other things that we try to do well is that if you are having issues with swallowing or maybe you're having difficulty because of taste changes, um, dry mouth, any of those other, you may not want to eat a lot and or swallowing may be a little bit more difficult or unpleasant. And so can our team leverage all of their individual resources, like our speech language pathologists or dietitians and our physical therapists to really come up with an optimized plan for you. And so this again will vary. Um, and I also think while I've highlighted these treatment related effects, um, specifically musculoskeletal and, and given an overview of the others, it's very important for us to recognize that these physical side effects can impact your kind of so psychosocial um, quality of life. They can have scans coming up, contribute to anxiety, changes in your function can um, contribute to depression. And so how can we really address your psychosocial needs also? And we partner with clinical psychology. We partner with psychiatrists. We also have support groups um, with patients of a variety of head and neck cancers. Um, and a lot of the symptoms overlap, so they have a really um, great network of how to provide more peer-to-peer -peer support. And so it continues to be an important um, area for us to address, not just the physical and the psychosocial, but also some of the other um, kind of domains that we know change after treatment. And so in the end, and I know if there are more specific treatment-related effects that you'd like to talk about, um, I'm happy to do that in the breakout. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that your needs are very complex. And after we have done and completed your treatment, that it really takes a special team um, and a really a collaborative team. And that can be done in formal ways and informal ways to address your side effects and to optimize your quality of life. And this 
is usually best with a comprehensive approach and that I firmly believe as a researcher that um, people do have differing side effects and it's probably more than just treatment. It may be some other biological impact that they have um, that somebody may react more to radiation than another individual that there is really research that's needed to be able to identify patients who are at greater risk. So then we can, again, continue to tailor your care and start earlier than be have a more reactive approach. And so there are slides, there are some of the guidelines I mentioned, but additional, the American Cancer Society, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the Head and Neck Society, all have some more clinic clinician facing, but there are also more patients um, directed guidelines. They will be general, but you may find some of those beneficial um, in identifying ways to kind of help manage. We are your advocates, but you are also your best advocate. And so really knowing and raising your concerns and if you're unsure, if some of the things you're experiencing, especially in that late, you're done treatment, you're not sure, it's best to ask is this potentially related to my treatment that I've had um, years ago and how can we address it? So I just wanna thank you. And if you have any questions, um, that's my email. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Nielsen. And thank you everyone for all of our wonderful speakers this morning. Great overview about many of the, uh, many of the aspects of caring for uh, patients with olfactory neuroblastoma. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER.